She uses words like building and structure to describe her practice and output, reflecting an emphasis on the work's form, construction, and sculptural qualities. Please join me for what is sure to be a fascinating conversation with artist Rachel Hayes. You are muted, my friend. All right. Okay. Thank you for coming, everybody. And thank you, Christian. And thank you, Joanne, for having me. Um, I thought I'd start by, I guess, filling you all in about how I ended up in Tulsa. Um, Eric, my husband, is an artist too, and we've moved all around the country together. And um, the Tulsa Artist Fellowship brought us here. And we were looking for a good a place to kind of call home after living in New York and New Mexico and Iowa and Kansas City and Virginia. And, and so um, it's a, for three years we had full support for studio and living and, um, and a stipend. So it was a really great place to relocate with that support. So um, having said that, and um, I thought I would just, I mean, Joanne covered my resume pretty good. Um, so I'll just take you on a tour of my studio. And I'm going to start by, I think I'm going to start by um, showing you outside. Let's see. I'll take you outside real quick to show you. And let me know if I'm moving around too fast. But let's see. So like, there's Tulsa, downtown Tulsa. And then here's our studio. And um, you know, I'll, I'll show you a lot of different things that I'm working on. I work on a lot of different things at one time, especially when I don't have a pressing deadline. Um, and, you know, the works that are at the museum right now it are, are sewn textile works, which, you know, sewing, I guess there's three main things that I love to do and, um, and feel very confident doing and they're sewing, crocheting, and basketry. So um, those are kind of the three processes that I, I'm really drawn to. Um, and Eric, let's see, will you open the garage door? I got it. There's not a ton of light in my studio except for just this front front entryway. So I will go ahead and open the door. All right, so I walk in and I kind of arranged a lot of some things for you guys all to see, but um, these are two different panels. I love to put a couple of different things together, not unlike what's, what's at the show just to see how they interact with one another. And then this is, this is kind of my experiment area. Um, this, a lot of these things have actually been photographed outside and then they come back to the studio and they might go back outside again. And I just keep thinking about how to, different ways to look at things. So Rachel, as you, as you take us around your studio and you mention that some of these objects live outside and inside and then outside again, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about like when you're conceptualizing the work and part of your process, are you 
envisioning a final destination or is there such thing as a singular destination or home for any of these these objects in the panels? That's a good question. Um, the pieces that are at the, the Nevada Museum of Art, they, I brought them, I made them in my studio and then brought them to the farm up in South Dakota. And um, I brought them without really having like, um, a, a huge plan um, and just kind of sat sat with them up in the landscape for a few days till I figured out what I would how I wanted to see them and um, there's something about like not having a plan that leaves things open a I mean, it was so spontaneous and, and um, there's something that, that's really exhilarating about that. And also when you're bringing work like this outside, it also helps to not worry about it getting destroyed. So it, in some ways, like I didn't have a plan that I was gonna ever show those in a gallery or a museum. So it left, it left things, they, they're not precious to me in that way so that I can feel free to explore with them and, and let them potentially get wrecked if, if that happens. If, I'm gonna, um, if you don't mind, I wanna screen share for a second because you shared with me an amazing image of, uh, from South Dakota, I believe, that is, I'm pretty sure it features the work that's in the museum. That, yeah. That I love because it, um, it really highlights how, let's, um, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Sorry that we don't have the full. We're going to get the, the full slideshow so you can see it big. So these are the. So in, in, in that case, you know, we had. Um, I was just, I was looking for two tall points that we could reach. A lot of. A lot of. Um, when I'm working outside, it's, it's less of. It, I'm not necessarily, um, I guess I'm, I'm looking for what I can use that's there instead of bringing things into it, into the landscape, because, um, I mean, there was that tractor there and it was, it was the, the highest point we could reach because the barn you can't crawl on the roof of that barn other because this the uh it's not strong enough to probably walk on or no one wanted to do that i don't <laughs> i wasn't gonna ask anyone to do that um which would have been eric and um so we tied it to the top of uh the top of that tractor and then we had a long extension pole and actually eric's sister was holding the other end of the pole and then I was just running around taking photographs <laughs> and and so I mean it was there it's so awesome because it it is so spontaneous and and I then you know I just take as many photographs as I can and one of the things that I really loved about that piece was um those grasses that are in front of the, the work. I have a bunch of pictures with the, the grasses with all of the color behind it and the sun peeking through. I mean, it, there, that was something unexpected that I was really drawn to. And so there's always those types of wonderful things that can happen um, with the light and the wind and, and just feeling good because I was out there with my family and no one no one is like you know no one's judging no or or thinking too much about what are you doing or no one's questioning if it's art or it's just really a, kind of a free free place to explore i think one of the things for me when i when i think about your work and i'm going to move to a, another slide here is how 
the the pieces themselves really create space and um, the they they function as artworks but they also function as like very immersive within the landscape as a whole um, and the next series of photos is is from work that you did in white sands new mexico and i know that this piece that you have in the studio if you make it see your your thumbnail there that's one of these pieces correct yes that's the piece here i'll i'll hand um is that this piece let's see yeah that that's the piece and that's about 30 by 30 feet and um i just loved how i mean we were probably a couple hundred feet away from that and it it just kind of felt like there was a hole in the in the in the earth it just the whole setting was so beautiful with the the way that the sand is like curving down to form a bowl kind of like a hammock for the work and give it its own um structure i guess but we we talked about this in a previous conversation but there's something especially when i look at a, at a work like this and i and i'd like to ask you to speak you mentioned like when you're in south dakota and you're taking the work outside you're with family um there's no pretension there's no um errors about if it's artwork or not artwork you're just out there being able to have fun and i look at an image like this with this massive piece that feels like a living room rug to me mm -hmm. um, and there's these levels of intimacy in, in architecture there's a, a term called intimacy gradient where you build in um closeness um, and so much of what i feel like and I, and i hope i'm correct that you're playing with is is scale and mm -hmm. how things work up close and how they work far apart and there's something about your work for me that just always draws me in and I'm, I'm curious how that, how much of that is, is intentional and, and built into the work and, and changes over time as you display it in different settings, um, even within the same environment. And on that note, I'm going to, while you talk about that, I'm going to switch to same work, but from underside. Yeah. Um, I think it, I definitely am thinking about that and, um, here, let switch to me real quick. Yep. Cause I'm gonna pull out this this panel real quick. Like the very middle of this piece. This is that piece that you were talking about. It's so small. You know, I started with just like a, a small little piece and then just start building round and round. And So it definitely like, like what we were also talking about, um, the idea of like the powers of 10. And it, like in the middle of this piece, it's really intricate and, um, you know, like a patchwork almost. But by the time it gets to the edges, it's, it's, a, it's more stripes, like zooming stripes that have a different kind of movement. Like this is, this is more, um, this is really intimate here in the middle. And then up here, it's, it's, it's more bold. And I think about a lot, a lot of, I mean, that's definitely like a recurring theme in my work is like this intimate moment and everything is, is very handmade. And, um, and I, I, I think like sincere with the materials and trying to take advantage of the materials and and um, and then it, and then it just becomes more like like a bold gesture that's like that uh, is like beckoning someone to like to grab your eye in a way and it in a more um, in in a more um, I guess instinctual guttural response to scale and color is like the edges of the piece. There's, it's and, funny, when you, when you talk about action, it, it reminds me of the idea of, of action painting where you have these very tiny gestures uh, that can build to larger gestures. And there's something very painterly about your work for me, for me um, where they're, 
they're tactile, although we, we can't touch them. Please don't touch them if you come visit the museum. <laughs> but there is structure there um, in, in how they're put together with sewing and that there's still um, the, the sort of creases and, and lines where the, the fabric has been pushed and pulled by the threads. Um, mm -hmm. When you're working with material, and this is something it, as we move further into to showing some more of your work, that you oscillate between opaque and transparent. Mm -hmm. and how did you know? I know that you you think of the works as living inside and outside. How does that that materiality and your choices around that? How does that emerge and and play into into your process and creating these panels? Um. I think, huh? Yeah, uh, I was uh, really drawn to when I was in um, a student learning all the textile techniques. I was really uh, drawn to this process of um, dyeing velvet. It was the silk velvet, and you could apply. Um, apply this chemical to the back of the velvet and it would release the pile and so it would be sheer so there there was i could play with this sheer and opaqueness and i was dyeing the colors and um so i mean that's that was that's was kind of the beginning of it all and then just thinking about how when you're using sheer colors you can layer them um to you know it's it's like a it's an a lot it's an alive thing that when you move around the colors behind it change i guess and i think that's exciting so i guess it's really sculptural in that way where i mean i would i personally like hope people walk around and see the different thing different views to be had with this type of work. Yeah, I think I thinking about the work in White Sands and some, some other examples that we'll see and jump to, uh, there's, you know, it, it's it's great to be able to see it in full presentation view like you see it in the Nevada Museum of Art right now. But there is, uh, there is something to living underneath the space between um, mm -hmm. and in front of and behind and having to tromp through the grass or something of that nature. In fact, we, we have a question from the audience, which is that, you know, David says, I often object to examples of land art because of there's a disturbance in nature. Um, and he applauds your ephemeral pieces that don't really disturb the landscape. Have you thought about what limits there should be and how you interact with the landscape to not so much disturb it, but insert your work in, in and amongst it? I guess I, I look at it in a similar way that I'm looking at, um, you know, if I'm going to work within the confines of a architectural space, like where can I hang from? What what's going on? Um, how tall can we get? How tall is the tree? You know, um, it's a it's a I guess it's more of like a collaboration and 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 compromise and um, with with whatever landscape I'm working with. I mean, it could even be um, my building. I mean, I don't wanna disturb my building outside. I'm, th you know, I'm thinking of personally, like if I, um, you know, I, I might have some ideas of some things to, to do outside here in Tulsa in a more urban setting. And I don't want to disturb that either. Right. So I, I guess I didn't ever have the option to disturb it. So I ne it never even crossed my mind because I'm not going to, you know, most of these, these things that I'm doing are, they don't last more than a few hours so it's not like you know i, I de for the white sands you know he spent all day out there photographing and just trying out different things and 
you know, you put, you put a big piece like this out there and you realize how small it is. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I guess I, I, I think that's, you know, more and more also like, I don't want to disturb the landscape and say it's mine because more often than not, it didn't ever belong to me. Um, you know, I'm more aware of like, um, who the land belongs to also, you know, especially being here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, I think that's really important to note. And it, it feels like many of these pieces are, um, they're like gifts. Uh, they're, it's a, it's a small offering that's made um, and that vanishes, you know, in physicality, but so much of your work, um, you know, I don't think you're a photographer, but so much of your work lives in that, in that realm of photography, which is really congruent with uh, the history of land art as a whole. Um, yeah. Uh, Here, go ahead and switch it to me. I was just, but after you said, you showed that piece, you showed that picture of the underside of the piece. Yeah. We were talking about, um, you said something that made me just like, you know, now I haven't unfurled this piece since it was in white sands with Moussoni, and it still is like covered in dust and sand. And, um, uh, Partly because I didn't have the space to do it until recently. But now that I've got it hanging up in this space, I was just thinking like, I might try like, conveniently the wire, but I might try some things while it's up. Just to see what happens like, because I think it could be really interesting to see, you know, what this, now that it's been outside it's, and it's been around the block, like maybe it could do some really awesome things inside too. There's definitely a level of play with the idea of soft architecture um, in creating, you know, when, when work is hung more vertically um, and we'll, we'll get to the works, that, some works that you've done inside where there's, you know, again, I'm going to go back to the idea of placemaking. Um, and I, I love that there is such an ephemeral quality to it where other artists might dig in the ground or um, place, you know, stones in the ground or something of that nature. Um, that there's a, an above and below, there's an around in, in the work. Uh, so one question that we have coming in from a, a couple of folks, um, including one of our younger viewers is a piece like this how what, what is the process and timeline um and i, I there's something I, I know we talked about that i want you to show us in your studio how much planning do you do as far as how these objects are arranged and how you think of composition in building them out do you start with a fairly like for example with this piece yeah or something like this like how do i start yeah um here um this piece i made this i started when i was still living in brooklyn and i could not get to the fabric store because i had just had a baby and the thought of like going to midtown and fabric shopping was just too much to bear and um, i i realized i have a lot of materials already um, and so I was just really into using what I have. And so like, for example, uh, I usually have a, a pile of smaller pieces of fabric. Because when you're making something like this, I'm cutting it along the way and there's usually uh, some leftover fabric. And so, um, you know, I don't have a plan for this piece except that I, I want to try like the concentric square idea again, um, where like each each layer is a different color and to play with the op opaque and sheer and opaque. So like I, I think, you know, I'm going to put white next. So in that way, it's, it's very intuitive. Um, 
you know, this piece, it might end up being really big. I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, if I have all, all the time in the world, then I could probably make something like that in, you know, if I'm working like 15 hour days or longer, I mean, I don't know, a couple weeks maybe, but, um, so does that answer the question? Yeah, it sounds like in, in many ways, especially getting to see your studio and seeing the, the piles of your fabric stash here and there, um, that there's multiple projects that are ongoing that you can sort of bounce between back and forth. Um, and that there's also decisions being made, but also you're letting the material and the fabric kind of dictate and, and steer the pieces as they develop on their own. With, with something like that, for sure. Like, and that's, and that's, um, it's fun to be able to work on something like that and not have a plan and be able to make choices as I go. Um, how, like having said that, like for, for an exhibition, like um, actually for like even the pieces that are at the museum, there's five of them, of the, them at that size, 11 by 15. Cause I showed them in Tulsa, um, in that space and so that's that's why they were 15 feet tall um so but then i i made them the same way though i set out like okay this one is gonna um you know i had my colors a little bit more chosen probably because uh, i had more of a plan so like this is this is one of my stashes so i might um really, you know, like maybe just like pick out, start with like a few colors. Um, and then, um, what do you call it? New material. I'm starting with new material. Like if I have, if I have a plan, I'm starting from with um, uh, new, but I'm also like, what am I gonna do with all of these scraps? Like, so in some ways, I have to, I have to keep using them. Um, so it, it's interesting. You know, that's, that's totally how this large piece like started. It just kept going and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, when you're building it like that, cause you're using the scraps that are around you. And I think you know, somebody asked me if, if the fabrics are recycled and I think this kind of shows that they they are that they they overlap and they spill one piece into the next piece is there a point when a work is is finished do you have a certain size constraint in mind that you're like when it gets to this big we're done i'm creating these five 15 by 15 panels um or you know time and resources aside would you just keep going well like the, those pieces that i just covered up by hanging that up um I mean, that was like, that was kind of an assignment I gave myself with the, the, um, let me take this down. Or come over here. <laughs> with, you know, sometimes I get sick of all the pattern and all of the tiny, 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 and the need to do something that feels more open and fresh and not, um, and <laughs> without, um, I don't know. I just, I, I wanted to make something big, but not have tiny, tiny, <laughs> if that makes sense. So yeah. like, I, I, I cut out, I was like, I'm just gonna cut a yard of um, all the colors that I have and um, arrange them in these nine patch squares so I have it felt really good it felt like a break for my eye and um and i don't know just it feel it feels like an open-ended more open-ended piece 
So that's kind of where I'm at. This is probably the last thing that I've made, like sewn. These are the most recent, these are, uh, I hate to call these pandemic pieces, but these are made during this quarantine period? Yeah, they were made this summer when I went to um, South Dakota. And let's see. And I, you know, I made them, I like to give myself something to work on. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but, you know, and take different photographs of them out at the farm. It's so great how they function so differently, either I know. Together or, or blowing in the wind. And so, I didn't have anyone to hold the pole except for my niece. Zelda, who's 10, was holding that piece. <laughs> and then Shay, my daughter, is like back there too. And the dog is back there too. And, um, and then I took it to, took them to my parents, you know, completely different setting offers a different way to see them. They're, they're so painterly in those settings. And, you know, I think that we can all, um, hopefully see how, you know, they, they function really, you know, that could be a painting that, that hangs on the wall in a museum just as easily, um, as, you know, this structure in, in nature. Are there artists that you look to in, you know, perhaps, you know, Frank Stella's or uh, Stanley Whitney's in, in drawing your inspiration? Are you, are you looking to the traditions that, that are more rooted in textile work? Or are you looking at, at painters or who, where are you finding additional um, resources? Definitely, definitely Stanley Whitney for work like this. And then I used to love Frank Stella. Um, there was a huge piece at the, there is a huge piece of his at the Kemper Museum in Kansas City. Um, oh, like, I kind of feel like I, I really am in love with the first artist that I discovered and um, when I, you know, like I still love Polly Applebaum. And she was the one who gave me permission to put these on the ground in a way, in some ways. And I love Jessica Stockholder yeah. and yeah. The, the found objects and found colors. And she arranges them into these um, kind of formal scenarios. And I remember getting her book and real realizing that she frames those. She, she frames these little these vignettes that she makes in the pictures of the book and it all it looks like a drawing or a painting. Um, I was in love with Jean Davis at one point uh, in my life, the striped painter. Um, and definitely like in, a, in this is definitely this I don't know if you can see this picture but I and even like these. Yeah. These, I definitely thought of Gene Davis. I love, um, you know, he would throw in a black or a gray or a brown to kind of throw off some of the really hot colors. One of the things for me, I also think of Katarina Gross quite a bit, and it, I think it's a disservice to her work that she's not included in sort of the canon and ideology of land art. But I, I feel very that, that there's a real kinship there in how you're using the landscape as um, as a continued extension of your canvas. Um, that the work your work in white sands doesn't stop where the edge of the fabric stops necessarily, but the the entire landscape becomes a part of that, and you've painted on top of it with with your placement of a panel. Is that? I love I love how um, I mean maybe she will be someday or you know, so it just to be put in the landscape, but she, um, she kind of get she gives permission to like see think like if something is only halfway hanging up, maybe it doesn't need maybe that's, that's how it should be. And in my mind, um, it's good for me to think about people like that, 
because I always, I tend to want to finish everything and tighten it up. So it's, I really um, appreciate her, the way she works and, and it feels very free. And so like when the wind, if we're working outside and the wind is doing something magical, I mean, that's a way for me to like, to feel loose, I guess. Right. So before, I, before we, we run out of time, I want to jump forward and I'm going to share an image um, and talk about your work that lives inside and specifically if we can talk about um, landlines, which was a Perfect. monumental uh, installation you did at Lowell Ryan Projects in Los Angeles. Yeah, before I share an image, and I think this goes back to um, preparation and how much you, you see things forward. Can you talk about what you've got right there and then we'll share some images of inside. And um, I think there's some, some unique yeah. connections there. I, I hope you can. So this is a this is a picture of the gallery. And then there's the work in the gallery. And like I was saying before, here's the roof. It has these slats all the way across. Okay, so we visited the gallery and I had um a couple of these panels with me and we just quickly threw them up to see what it looked like. Um, and, and then the, the idea was born pretty much. Right. So the architecture dictated how tall these were going to be. So then there, that gave me um, something to start with. And then, and then I just started. So I let's just say I made that one first, which I think I did. And then I thought, well, I better um, put, you know, maybe chop things up a little bit. Knowing that you are gonna walk through the space and see one through the next or, and be able to walk around. So I also, you know, had my palette with this one and was, you know, very clear, you know, sure to have the, there's usually like a black slash either going horizontally or vertical in, in each one. And, you know, I don't, if one has a green edge, I'm not going to put a green edge on the next one. You know, there's there's a lot of rules within the uh, the intuitive ways of working. Do you? I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to a screen share uh, so that we can see okay. uh, this in uh, so we can see this as well. Uh, so this is the installed an installed interior view, um, and then and for me this is really you know. I, I asked earlier about transparent versus opaque and um, in an installation like this, I think that's where those choices like really ring through and they become, um, you know, it becomes a, an interior landscape almost um, where you've got a- I, I think of it as like an unfolding line drawing. Nice. You, you know, um, the artist Don Clements and she makes these really long pencil drawings and she would tape one piece of paper to the next and just keep going. And they're, um, you know, they could be like eight feet wide. And so I guess in some way, I definitely like, her work is very different, <laughs> but I, I like that way of thinking about it. So it's like, when you think of a piece like this, is it one, um, rather than just being a body of, of multiple works, do you view it as a singular work? Well, I think that the, you mean the installation, is it a singular work? Yeah. Mm, 
I think they could be, yes, that, that definitely like was a moment in time that happened in that space and with that light, you know, kind of all on one side of the space. And, um, you know, I make them to stand alone as individuals, but I prefer them to be at least have a partner, a diptych or triptych to like, because then I guess that makes it become more sculptural for me if there's two talking to each other. And it's almost like if there's just one presented, um, you know, it's great, but it definitely is talking more about like the way a quilt is displayed or a painting is displayed. And when there's two, then you can take advantage of like the relationship that can happen if they're layered or across from each other or, um, I just think that there's, it's maybe more interesting more than one. So, I mean, I don't think these have to stay together, but I think, um, I mean, they look, they're, they're, they work, they were made to be together. Right. Well, especially that was, that was one moment in time. I mean, I just don't think like, um, I'm not, I don't have a firm enough of an opinion to like defend that idea, I guess, that they should be together. And it's great to see them uh, individually, like in the landscape uh, at White Sands as one piece, but then, you know, there's other images where they're clustered together. And it again reminds me of what you said early at the very beginning of this talk when around, you know, that the joy of getting to be with family and getting to be together with people outside displaying them, you're running around taking photographs and that there, there's a, um, a sense of community that forms um, when looking at your work and how they, they come in families um, and, mm -hmm. and live individually. We all live individually as do the works, but they, they live within that, that sort of a family or unit. Um, before, we, before we get close to the end here, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna run through a couple of the questions that we've got coming in. They're okay. a little bit more technical and then maybe we can finish with you telling us about that piece that's uh, in frame right now, hanging from the, from the ceiling. So just- Oh, a, this one. Yeah, a couple of quick questions. What type of fabrics do you like to use? Do you, do you work with different types of fabrics other than what we see in the panels? And then what's your process for putting yeah. it together? Are you using a commercial machine? <laughs> um, let's see, like, I do have a lot of different materials like this, for example, this is like this construction netting. I just love how sheer it is and it can be outside. Um, in this piece, it's got these kind of golden, golden squares and they're actually like these woven napkins that I found at a estate sale. Um, but I love them because they're sheer. They're like, um, like wire wrapped thread. Mm -hmm. Um, seems like they're better suited to your work than as a napkin. Yeah. And you know, like this is a, the ultimate example of all the materials like this sculpture, which has got you know, like that's a little piece of Japanese fabric. This is a little piece of Mexican embroidery, Chinese, you know, I, there's some mud cloth. It's like a um, homage to like all of the, all of the different ways of like, of textiles, of like my collection. Right, and some serape. Some serape, some sweater. Um, and like, and that was, this is kind of playing off of the piece, like a, an experiment, another experiment in South Dakota. So, um, what? 
Oh, there's, hang on, I'll show you. This is, um, this might be hard to see, but this is tool, which I'm kind of excited about exploring more because it's so sheer. Um, and maybe playing with layers of that. Um, and like, I'm right now I've kind of got this ongoing experiment with trying to find the perfect kind of grass to sow onto. So this is going into the sewing machine. This is my dirty sewing machine. <laughs> this is the one that I bring, I can travel with and sew outside with and pound the heck out of different things with and not worry about it too much because it's really strong and sturdy and it's, it's made to like fix your sail on a boat. Um, and then this machine, this machine is for, to get really technical. Um, a, a lot of these industrial machines, you, you move your knee to move the pedal up. And if you do this a thousand times a day, you're gonna get hip problems, which I've got. And so this this new machine, I can lift the foot up with my foot. It's like there's a little pedal down here. Yeah. So that was kind of a, a game changer. Um. And 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 then um, just to like talk about you know some of the more sculptural works or or yeah. experiments. Like working on things like this in a really large scale or, you know, like a, a, a huge installation, it's like I have to really literally give my body a break in my mind. And it's like a different kind of exercise to work with the different material. So like, this is just, this is um, all of the crocheted, um, light gels that I used in an in installation with Missoni, but they, we wrapped them around these towers. And in my studio, I'm just taking all of that material and trying something different. And, you know, I can imagine this being in um, anywhere from like a, a you know, a smaller gallery, like intimate setting where you're walking around it. But I think it could also be like a really incredible atrium piece with a ton of light around it. So it feels, yeah, it feels like it could be an extension of the architecture much in, in the same way that I think that uh, the landlines piece functions uh, or body yeah. functions. Where it... Yeah, because my studio actually is a very similar ceiling, mm -hmm. which is great. There's lots of points to hang from, and that so that de that definitely like influenced how I started this piece. So as we as we wrap up here, and I know that we could talk for a long time, and I want to I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Um, this last question, I think is really interesting and it deals with time. Uh, David, who's, who's watching us says he's a former Oklahoma resident. And he says, uh, pardon me for thinking uh, that Tulsa is not the center of contemporary, is not a contem center of contemporary art. Um, do you find Tulsa time to be con conducive to creativity? Has it changed how you work and, and, and what you're working on? Uh, I think it's been perfect for where I am in this time in my life with two young kids and um, yes I do like Tulsa time and I like the scale of this city actually too having lived in um, New York City and then I've also lived in Roswell New Mexico in Iowa City you know so that very small town and very big city and I'm from Kansas City and that Kansas City is much bigger than Tulsa and I I really like 
this size city. I mean, maybe it's similar to Reno. I was um, going to say, I think it's probably pretty similar. And I, I really hope that you're able to come and join us at some point. Me and, too. Uh, play in our desert. Uh, we've got a, we've got plenty of landscape for you to to bring some panels to. <laughs> yeah, I would love nothing more than to do that. And hop in the car, bring every bring the family, and explore and find um, just the right spot, the sweet spot. Yeah. Well, we had a one of our viewers, Eleanor, uh, mentioned that you should bring your work out to Burning Man. We can, you can come and we, we can bring you out to where Burning Man happens. I think that'd be a, a wonderful playground for you. Um, I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. Rachel, thank you so much for all of your time and showing us around your studio and sharing your work with us. Um, as a reminder for everybody who's viewing, oh, I also want to thank Eric, your husband, who's been yeah. operating the camera and pointing things out and steering you around. <laughs> Uh, Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Um, but um, as a reminder, uh, Rachel's work is on view right now in the In the Flow exhibition, which is at the Nevada Museum of Art, which is open. Um, you could head down and, and check it out this afternoon if you're in the area. Um, Rachel, thanks again. Please come out and visit. Let's let's go explore with some panels. And um, yeah, thank, I'd love to. Um, thank you as well to Joanne, who I believe is still here um, for including your work in this exhibition and, and getting to share it uh, with, with everybody here in this region. Thank you, Rachel. That was fascinating. And thank you everyone for attending. Oh, Absolutely. thanks, Joanne. And thank you. I'm so excited that I'm in that show and uh, with that group of artists and, and aligned with that dialogue. It's, so, um, you're in good company. Yeah, it's a really tremendous show and your work is really kind of the cornerstone in many ways of, of the exhibition and just feels that it, you haven't gotten a visit, but it's a, it's a beautiful double height gallery where you get to really experience Rachel's work up close and from far away, uh, even from a landing up above it. And I, I highly recommend that for everybody. Um, my thanks again to the Core Humanities Program at uh, University of Nevada, Reno and uh, Nevada Humanities Program. Uh, for sponsoring today's program. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next year with um, all new Art Bites and more programming. Rachel, have a great holiday and a great weekend. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye, everybody.